Okay, we're going to get started, and I want to welcome Ted Kanapke, who's a member of our church. He served as a, a school teacher, principal, and superintendent, and he is a volunteer with the American Promise, a member, and so we look forward to this important presentation. Um, and there will be time for questions and answers, and you can feel free to interrupt to, uh, with your questions. But let's start with prayer. Okay, let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for the gift of this time and this day and this opportunity to learn and grow and serve you and serve your people. So teach us and help us to be faithful and responsible citizens. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Good morning. Thanks for joining us this morning. I know it's a full weekend. Morning. You may have stayed up late last night for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> it paid off. Yes, it is. Second half is much better, wasn't it? Uh, and the weather isn't exactly conducive, but uh, it's good to see everybody here. Um, and start off, uh, direct your attention, of course, to the slides. I'm going to have a lot of information, but I'm going to try to go through it uh, as quickly as possible without rushing. And some of them will be repetitive because it's probably new information to a lot of you. Uh, I was, a, as Tom said, a, a high school math teacher, a principal, and a superintendent. I was a math major, and I loved literature, but I was never a history person. Okay. And I've learned a lot the last five years since I retired and got involved in this. Uh, it was just fascinating, some of the things that I've had a chance to read and become familiar with. Um, I'm sure some of you know a lot more about uh, our history than I do, but I think you'll maybe hear some things that you haven't thought about. So, um, start off is over 200 years ago, our forefathers embarked on an ambitious and unique journey. By most standards, the system they developed has been very successful. Many would say it's a governance system that is a model for the entire world. And uh, that's where we come to uh, what you see on the slide there. Uh, however, for several reasons, many experts are saying the system has been severely compromised in recent decades. A number of organizations have emerged in recent years to deal with what those experts see as a threat to the civic and economic foundations of our country. Now, they see a dire need to pass an amendment to the U.S. Constitution, putting reasonable limits on federal and state campaign contributions. If you would, uh, imagine a system, economic system, where organizations and businesses create a standard of living that benefits all Americans. Mm -hmm. There's a significant trend in that system, the economic system, toward what we call pay-to-play politics. And it happens on both sides of the aisle. And this this week is our ability to speak constructively to people with their views or to solve societal issues. Uh, the problem is also greatly reducing our country's ability to sustain an economy where uh, companies compete based on the value that they create in the marketplace. Uh, this reduces the number of jobs which pay a living wage and therefore required for many things. Thus, there is a direct connection to the role and function of organizations and businesses and the general well-being of our country. Today, our focus is not on politics, but on the civic foundations that enable peace, prosperity, and human well-being. Our discussion is not merely Republican or Democratic, it's an American issue, put forth by American Promise. So strictly a nonpartisan organization, we have members across the country. Uh, it's one of probably seven or eight organizations with a similar mission. Some are going about it a little bit differently, has some different points of view, but the mission is pretty much the same. Put some reasonable restraints on the amount of money being contributed by billionaires, of which there are now over 700 in the United States, if you're aware of that. Um, large companies, unions, uh, whatever the, the source is, we need to put, the feeling is we need to put some limits reasonably. So our primary goal today is just to increase awareness and the need for a solution using both civic and economic reasoning to explain the important role that civic leaders 
and business leaders can play in advancing American Promises' goal of passing an amendment by 2026. Uh, American Promise was initiated in 2016 by an attorney in the Boston area, he had me one of the lead attorneys on the Philip Morris lawsuit, uh, which was a big, big win. And his thought was, he was Jeff Clements. I met him in Ohio State about six years ago when I got involved. Uh, he was thinking, what am I gonna do with this windfall, basically? And he decided campaign finance was something that really needed to be addressed. And he's made that his life's mission. As, a, as I said, there's a great deal of information which is relevant to the campaign finance reform. And I'll move through it fairly quickly. I apologize, I do need to read this quite a bit. I don't wanna miss important information. This is the first time I've done this presentation. I've presented to several Rotary groups, but that was pretty much uh, geared toward business people. And I've modified it and with a couple of others, American Promise. Uh, so I'm reading this a bit just to make sure I don't miss some key points. <clears throat> so let's uh, go to the next slide. Um, as an Ohioan, like most of you, I've witnessed the influence of money in our state government many times in the last decades. The payday lending scandal dominated Ohio legislator in 2018. Most recently, because of the 60 million, 61 million first energy bribery scandal, Ohioans have literally paid heavily as a result of this pay to play phenomenon. In 1971, when I got out of college, a good friend of mine recommended I look into a group called Common Cause. It's a nonpartisan group, it's a watchdog group in Washington, D.C. It was founded by John Gardner. And he said at the time, if we don't get large campaign contributions out of our system, our democratic form of government will be in grave danger. He had no way of knowing how uh, insightful he was. Today, American Promise is one of the leading cross-partisan organizations advancing that strategy uh, for winning a constitutional amendment. We believe it has to be a grassroots approach. It has to be bipartisan. Um, and again, it's. That's the mission to empower, inspire, and organize as many Americans as possible to put an end to that pay to play system. Our hope is the conversation today would inspire you to get involved, however you might like. Could be by signing. Uh, there's a sign in sheet. We appreciate you pass around. You're welcome to put your name. Of course, I can find you. <laughs> Seriously, I, what we'll do is I'll give these names and addresses it unless you don't want me to to American Promise and you could be on their email list and get information or you can go to their website uh, AmericanPromise.net and it's net not not org uh, there's another American Promise group uh, it's not AmericanPromise.net no. so why are we here again I'm volunteers Tom said if you go to the next slide uh, because I've been interested in campaign finance since uh, 1971 when Bill Lammers introduced me to Common Cause and pointed out the danger as uh, Mr. Gardner did. And we feel it's extremely important to invite civic minded, values driven citizens across the country to explore the topic. Personally, I'm passionate about the topic because, as a fiscally conservative independent voter, I feel that wasting billions of dollars is not in our best interest. You might wonder why are we wasting money because of this process? It's the businesses and billionaires and unions that are contributing the money. Well, the payback has been pretty well demonstrated. The return on investment, to we'll use the business term, is somewhere around 700 to 1. Uh, I remember reading back in the 80s, uh, I think it was Common Cause did a study, and they said for every dollar that these groups or individuals were contributing, they were getting in legislation, tax breaks, whatever it might have been, various different benefits, the return on investment was 700 to 1. And I've seen that consistently. Okay. It sounds astounding, yeah. but uh, it's been verified a number of times. So uh, again, my passion there is because of what I read and heard, uh, typically what we do in these slides is put the picture of the presenter up here. I chose to put this family picture up there because my main reason for doing this at 74, I'm not gonna see a lot of the effects of this if things keep going the way they are. I'm really concerned about what our kids are, in particular our grandkids, the world they're gonna live in for a variety of reasons. Uh, and it's just, it's reality, I think we're seeing that. So that's where my passion comes from, and why I would rather be doing this than sitting around uh, watching television. Uh, <laughs> Peter Schwartz, down on the right, is a futurist. He's a member of American Promise and National Business Network, which is an old entity unto itself, a really uh, strong organization working with businesses across the country. And he said, my life has been about taking the long view. Today's rules of the political game make it impossible 
for our government or businesses to take the long view. We need a 28th Amendment to give the future a voice. Now, again, this some of the presentations geared toward business, but I have really tried to morph it into something that appeals to the average citizen, civic leaders, uh, could be people in the private sector, including churches. Uh, I know we have a person down in uh, Northern Kentucky who is working through the presbytery uh, to work with churches. And quite frankly, I think that's a great idea. I think we talk about this more later. Uh, as Tom said, don't hesitate. If I say something that doesn't make sense or you want to question, let me know. I mean, we've got enough time. I think we can do Q&A during the presentation. But uh, I think a lot of what has occurred to me during this uh, whole process is our mission at the church is analogous to some of the things that this touches on. I'll get more into that later. Be interested in what your thoughts are. So anyway, what are, what are the chances of improving the quality of living in the United States when citizens get elected people are making important decisions approval rating under 20%? It's been there consistently. Uh, go ahead, Peter. Huh? <clears throat> Beyond the lack of trust in elected officials, a high level of corruption impacts both the function of government and the business environment. Both are keys to opportunity and a reasonably equitable distribution of resources. The goal is not that everyone ends up at the same level of resources, that's unrealistic, but that everyone has an opportunity to gain a reasonable standard of living. Uh, these factors, to me, are all related to part of a larger system. For example, uh, the Bipartisan Welfare Reform Bill passed in 1996 required every able-bodied person, should be not an able, required every able-bodied person uh, could not collect welfare unless they were looking for a job. Not an unreasonable um, uh, compromise. And it was bipartisan. Bill Clinton happened to sign it, and it went into law. And there were some ramifications that weren't positive, but uh, we'll get into that. Uh, but if you think about it, even though it was a reasonable expectation that we shouldn't have people freeloading off the taxpayers, uh, if someone makes $10 an hour, and they work 50 weeks out of the 52. Two weeks off is not exactly generous. If they work 50 weeks, they're going to make $20,000, well below the poverty level. So we passed this law, bipartisan law, and yet the reality is we don't have enough jobs to make it work. So we have people working two jobs and still barely making ends meet. In some cases, not able to pay their bills or have medical care. So that to me really hit me that even though we have that law, which makes sense, the reality is there's a whole lot of people struggling out there. It's, if anything, getting worse. If you would, I'm going ahead. So let's think about the idea of favorable conditions where success is based on the value created by organizations, including businesses. Most of us would agree that the vast majority of citizens, civic leaders, business leaders believe in certain common principles and fairness. Although our free enterprise system is intended to offer everyone an opportunity for economic success, it has been taken hostage, many experts would say, by forces that have greatly favored those who have the money and the power to get the results that favor them. Uh, and that results in some pork barrel projects and results in that 700 to 1 uh, ratio of return to investment projects, which really don't benefit a lot of people. It, it benefits, again, the, the union, the business, the billionaire. Uh, but it costs taxpayers money. We have a lot of projects uh, that just don't need to be there, but it serves the purpose of the donor. Too much to get to so, 30, 30. A little bit here, but I want to point out 90% of employers in the United States, small and medium sized businesses, those are just for a couple years ago. That may be changing. He's so hopeful. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, mergers that are happening. He told us but they create 55% of jobs. Would not work from many small and medium sized businesses. Don't you? 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 A political contribution. And it happens on both sides of the aisle. We had a governor, a Democratic governor, who tried to buy a spot last election, millions and millions of dollars. 
this fellow named Peter Thiel, I think, who's a um, billionaire who's donating millions and millions. Of yeah, it's happening on both sides of the aisle. In fact, we'll see later what the pattern has become. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, today's reality has drifted from those principles that were established originally. Dysfunctional incentives, particularly campaign contributions, a contributing system increasingly driven by political favors, tilting that free market capitalism toward crony capitalism. Some would even say we're trending toward oligarchy. Instead of rules that created uh, reward, uh, we have rules that foster pay to play. It's a strategy for making money for companies, wealthy individuals, special interests, use that other than spending to obtain, the, to obtain tax breaks, et cetera. Okay, I'm gonna skim ahead a little bit here. I wanna make sure we have time for Q&A. And again, don't hesitate to interrupt if I say something you wanna focus on. Okay, so those patterns result. Uh, it's occurring in many industries, involves many issues. Lack of opioid reg regulation was one. Uh, airline safety, tax code, financial regulations, antitrust violations, the reason we have these huge mergers now that can go unchecked in many cases. Uh, we have companies that end up feeling they must invest large sums of money just to defend their organization in the system. Uh, in fact, a survey from like 2013 showed that 75% of executives believe the U.S. campaign finance system is pay to play. 60% of national business leaders feels that there's pressure on corporate leaders to, to contribute. You can be sure those percentages are probably going up. Uh, slide number seven over on here. We've got time. Just real quickly, uh, some things that happened in Ohio. Uh, House Bill 6, we heard about last year or so. Uh, I met with Speaker Householder's main aide about six months before this came up. It was fascinating. Young man, bright guy. And we have American Promise as a pledge. We would like uh, legislators, particularly here in Ohio, to sign. And we've made no progress whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, it just happens our senator, uh, Senator Stephanie Kunze, she may be even your senator, uh, met with her and she was very uh, interested in this idea and seemed to be very much in agreement. Ironically, we had to end our meeting kind of short after about 20 minutes or so because Speaker Householder was being inducted that day or being made speaker. And she obviously had to leave. But she was very, very interesting. She said, let's continue the talk. Sorry, I have to go to the ceremony. 10 days way later, we couldn't get an answer. And I've learned through pretty good sources, she was told, and this is common, again, it's not one party or the other, you will not go there or you'll lose your funds. And it's, it's reality. Uh, so we couldn't get, get an answer with her. All right, so anyway, we had that. Again, the irony was this young man skimmed our, our uh, pledge. He said, no, there's no way the speaker will agree to this. He, he won't go along with this. Well, of course not. He was getting ready for a $61 million bribe. So that, that's the way it's working, again, at the state level and at the federal level. Uh, another example of that coin gate uh, I mentioned earlier, ECOT was the system We've read about your last couple of years. It's an online system that uh, uh, provides education at home to kids. Actually, there was a company before that called White Hat Management, which most of you probably didn't hear of. Uh, actually, the dispatch read an article oh, a year or two ago when uh, its founder, David Brennan, passed away, and it listed some of the major contributions he had made. He was a, a huge contributor to the governor at that time, and probably many of our legislators. In fact, I have a good friend who was in the State Department of Education at that point. Uh, he was actually the second command. And he has told me, we knew that this white hat management and what later became ECOT was costing taxpayers millions of dollars. They were making millions. Kids were going home. And I heard super, I was on the state superintendent's, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, or uh, sounding board for a couple of years. And I would hear superintendents from other school districts across the state saying, we're losing $5,000 per pupil when these kids take their money and go home and get on this computer system. Software wasn't real good at that time, probably still isn't great. Uh, there was no accountability. Uh, we had large districts lose maybe 100 students at 5,000 a person. Uh, so there was a drain on what public schools were getting. And yet, my friend said, we were being told 
if we got too close to it and tried to end it, we had people coming from the legislators telling us cease and desist. It was that clear. The money was speaking. So it, it's reality. Uh, and pharmaceutical, man, as you've seen for a couple of years, the dispatch and others have investigated this, the middlemen, um, and how much money is being lost to people who aren't really providing services, the middlemen, so to speak. CBS, I think, was one of the companies that was being investigated, among others. <clears throat> okay, uh, let's go ahead, Tom, if you want to make sure I'm aligned here with. Okay, so what's happening with the political spending? Most people are surprised to see how much it's been increasing. You can see here, uh, 2008, 5.3 billion. It's now up to 14.3. That's a quite triple, but it's over two and a half times what it was. And you can see it's both presidential, lighter blue, and congressional. Both are contributing to that extreme uh, increase. And that was a result of 2010 a Supreme Court decision called Citizens United. Probably heard of it. And there were others before that. But that one really put spending on steroids. Um, and much of that spending flows through super PACs, which can spend unlimited amounts of money Funded, often funded by dark money. I'm sure you all heard of that. It's money. You don't know where it's coming from. It come, could come from China, Russia, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, or another state. It's outside money. It's dark money that is somewhat laundered. We have what they call 501c3 and 5013c4 um, legal entities, which allow you to contribute. They may front as a uh, uh, public welfare group. Could you be uh, somewhat religious name on it. And it, pure and simple, is a way to run money through and make sure you don't know where it's coming from. And one of the, the sad parts of that is that most of that money ends up being attack ads. You've seen them a couple of days before the election. These vitriolic, uh, unsustainable ads come out. Uh, the person being attacked doesn't have time to defend it, and they work. So when you read about how much a particular uh, politician or candidate has raised, that's only part of the picture. You're not seeing what the opponent has raised to then get used for attack ads. And again, it's, it's bipartisan. It's the game that both parties play. One reason that I refused to become a member of one party was I kept getting these requests for funds, as we all do. And I actually ended up writing the letters before email. And I made multiple copies, and when they would send me a request, I would say, when you deal with campaign finance, I'll contribute. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, I'll contribute to whoever I want to based on their record and how they vote. And I don't care what party they're in. And uh, I got tired of sending those letters. <laughs> never did any good. You never got read. And then, yeah. <laughs> probably not. I really got read by some volunteer that yeah. you better than taking up your fire. So again, it's, it's both parties. But that lack of transparency allows campaign funds to come from out of state, out of country, uh, and it overshadows the priorities of the citizens in that state. Um, and another side effect of this whole system is the pressure to raise money uh, causes our legislators to be in perpetual campaign mode. Uh, we've got a couple slides that I didn't put in here. It actually shows people in these cubicles dialing for dollars. And that's what it's come to. I, I have no idea it's becoming that sophisticated. But a number of studies have shown, I didn't believe this at first, but I've seen it several times now, that politicians, office holders, spend 40 to 70% of their time raising money, dialing for dollars. Uh, they complain they don't have the time to actually do, to meet with, with their constituents, to read some of the bills that they're required to, to sign off on. Their aides have to do it for them. And then, of course, they've got the lobbyists to tell them what to do. And, and I don't see a problem. You know, people talk about lobbyists as if it's uh, a really bad thing. There's really nothing wrong with a lobbyist going in and telling a senator or a House of Representative person why a certain bill should be passed or what the value is, or, or maybe even recommending the bill. That's part of the democratic system, the democratic republic to be specific or be technical. But uh, it's one thing to go in and give my senator or my House of Representatives some good information of why this pharmaceutical bill should pass, uh, whatever it might be. But to walk in with a checkbook and give them millions of dollars, that's a whole nother game. That's, that's the problem, okay? 
So if you would, take row number nine. Okay, that, this just re reiterates what I said. We added this slide in. The top 10 wealthy donors gave 1.2 billion between 2010 and 2019. And it's been pretty well demonstrated. The candidate with the most money wins 90% of the time. So even though our representatives, our senators have a 20% uh, rating of uh, approval, they're getting reelected 90% of the time because they have the money for the ads and the campaigns. Uh, and the incumbents, obviously the ones that could build that war chest uh, over the four years, six years, whatever it is that they're in. That's why we have people have been there for 30 years. Yes, Jan. Well, um, I'm just wondering because I know we're having a little something this weekend and um, there's a lid on how much people can, can give. How do people work around that lid, Ted? I don't yeah. understand that. The 501c4s, basically. Okay. I'm not totally expert on this, but I know it's a very good question. But like an individual, like, um, it, I don't know, we looked online and... It's $2,700 per person is the limit. Mm -hmm. We have a slide coming up that will demonstrate okay. that 99 point some percent of people are under that in their donations. You know, those of us that donate a few hundred dollars to various candidates, whatever, uh, 99.8, I think it was, and we'll get to that slide in a minute, uh, I look ahead, it's the very next slide. Thank you. <laughs> there we go, on the left. And you can't read all this detail. Basically, it says in 2010, it was 2,400 was the limit. It's been increased all the way up to 2,700. But 99.83% of the donors are below that. On the other hand, the con combined contribution of top five donors per election cycle has gone from what you see in 2010 up to $500 million in 2020. 20. So the people over that have gotten around, a very good question, have gotten around that. How do they do it? Super PACs. Okay. And again, both parties do it. I'll show you in a minute, but two slides. Three so slides they, forward. like an individual, gives to a super PAC instead of directly to a candidate. Exactly. Okay. So the, that 520, that, that 2700 is, you, you can do it before the primary, and then after the primary, you can give another 2700. Could be. I don't know That's that. If you, so you know that, then I'll That's go. What? Depends on whether it's federal, state. Yeah, depends. That's like office. for president. But even if you could, to do it two stages, it'd be <clears> yeah. 5,400. But, but, but it pales in comparison. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the, the large corporations, <clears throat> unions, et cetera. Uh, when we talk to, uh, to people uh, over the last several years, we have union members. Well, we can't afford to lose our, our impact. Well, you might want to think about that. Yeah, this law would prohibit unions from, from giving them huge amounts of money. But your money union is, is paling. Union influence has drastically dropped in the last 10 years. You're being outspent 10, 100 to 1. So you're well off if you lose your clout, but if they lose much more clout. So it really would not impact unions quite, quite nearly as much as it would the, the huge corporations. Again, I'm not talking about small businesses or medium sized businesses. The vast majority of them can't afford to compete. So go ahead, to the top. And this is just another depict, depiction of what we're talking about. Unfortunately, uh, we're in the process of upgrading the slide for 2020, but you can see the trend arrow. Uh, the upper 1% went from 10% of campaign contributions up to nearly 40 in 2016. So it's conservatively, it's probably 50 to 60% now, the upper 1%. The upper 5% is probably up over 90% now. Just a huge disparity in where it's coming from. Yeah, go ahead, Tom, if you would. Now, this slide depicts, and again, you can't see all the details. Basically, it just shows you a pattern of those. The question was how many people trust our government always or most of the time? It's probably one of those liquor scales. And the last two issues were I trust them all the time or some of the time. Of those two answers, it was 70 some percent back in 1960 when Eisenhower crescent. And it went up a little bit, then it dropped precipitously down through 1980, mm -hmm. went up a little bit. You can see what happened. It went up again in 2000 and then started back down and it's continued to go down. That's the level of confidence our voters have uh, in the government. Again, it's not about the individual person necessarily. A lot of it is, we're talking about how corrupt politicians are, but a lot of it's just it's the system that we've morphed into. Okay, time to go ahead. Uh, Three wheeling here, I'll make sure I get back to lined up with. So 
you know, miss some things. Uh, yeah, that's, we've already covered that. One thing I would mention, well, uh, many may remember there's, there's a bipartisan bill called McCain-Feingold. It was passed, uh, it's called the McCain-Feingold Campaign Reform Act, passed in 2001. It was to deal with some of the abuses that were becoming evident of the huge money. Unfortunately, uh, it's been rendered virtually ineffective uh, by several five to four Supreme Court decisions. Um, two quick examples, 1976, there was a McCutcheon uh, versus Federal Election Commission, Supreme Court ruled again, five to four, money is speech. And therefore, uh, combine that with the fact that they said, uh, businesses are people. Well, businesses are made up of people, but what gender is a business? What <laughs> business isn't a person. The Constitution talked about personal rights. And business should have some rights. That's one place where we disagree with a couple of the organizations looking for solutions. Uh, American Promise isn't about to neuter, out to neuter businesses, but a business is not a person. Okay, But if you combine that rule into the business as a person and that people have a First Amendment right, the conclusion erroneous, as we would say, is then businesses can spend as much money as they want. And Citizens United in 2010 reaffirmed that over the objection of some states. In fact, there were some actually very conservative states that are trying to do some things. I think uh, Wyoming might have been one, maybe Minnesota. We're trying to do things this state level. And the Supreme Court said, no, you can't, based on the rulings of talking. Okay, so let's uh, um, talk. Yeah, but, yeah. so uh, people cannot spend uh, an infinite amount of money. Exactly. Neither can business, except uh, through. A question we talked about limitations on contributions. <clears throat> Does that apply to a contribution to a, a C4? Or can you contribute to a C4 unlimited? Um, what I've read there, Bill, I'm, again, I'm not the expert there, is that it's fine did for people to give the money. But that $2,700 is a little bit before it's two stages, it doesn't really apply for whatever reason. Um, and you contribute. I think they get around that, the C4, because of their designation as a religious or a um, community welfare. Well, not some kind of, you know, it's, and they dress it up as a really civically minded group when, in fact, and then there's some rules about whether the candidate can have an interaction. Well, all you have to do is find a middle person to do the interacting. Uh, again, both parties do it. Uh, so we're up to slide 13. That's 14. 14. All right, very good. Uh, so what if you would go back one time if you can, Grace? Sure. This just demonstrates what's happened over that time. What we're just talking about. The red bars are Republican. You can see back 2010, 12. 14, 16, Republicans were raising a lot more money than Democrats. That balanced out in 2018, 2020, uh, Democrats went around. In fact, it's difficult to get these statistics because it's dark money. It's really hard for the Pew Research, I mean, and Open Secrets is another one that really works in a nonpartisan manner to keep track of this. It's very difficult to track all the money because a lot of it gets uh, laundered, so to speak. So we end up with, as you saw, that declining uh, trust in government. And a lot of that is young people now. You've probably heard that, read it. Uh, really um, frightening that young people have gotten disenfranchised, they feel, from the system. Okay. Uh, one of the other notes before I go on is that uh, the expectation is that businesses, again, small and medium sized businesses, are expected to keep up with the tax code that is now. 76,000 pages long. You have no idea it's that long. Uh, so even, that's even after the alleged tax reform simplification in 2017. Uh, so regardless of what you thought of that bill or that tax uh, change, uh, there's no way. You've got to have some well-paid accountants and ex experts to figure out the tax code and the, the logical uh, legal loopholes. All right, so uh, got about seven or eight minutes. Again, I don't want anybody to get cut off from questions. So I'm going to skip right to the end. Uh, what we see on this next slide, if you would, Tom, is Professor Lessig has said, 
I don't know if this number might be a little bit high, but this is a direct quote. 96% of Americans, we keep seeing 80 some percent, uh, believe it's important to reduce the influence, but 91% don't think it's possible. And that's what I hear from Rotary groups that I've spoken to. They say, yep, boy, this is a great idea. Glad you're talking about it. Lots of luck. Yeah. <laughs> and the yeah. reality. You know? And we see what, what happened to Householder. He is still emailing his, his party members, and they're following his, his lead. Uh, he's been indicted, I think, by the FBI. But it takes a long time for, for the wheels of justice so, to turn. And again, it's, it's not just Republicans it's in Ohio. It's both parties. Okay, on the bright side, uh, go ahead, Tom. 75% uh, of Americans, which breaks down into different percentages by party, but even the lowest number being two thirds, and that was a couple of years ago. In fact, that was nine years ago. Given what's happening, I'm pretty safe to say, and we'll get an update on this slide soon, that number has gone up in every category. It's extremely bipartisan. And if you would go ahead, the next slide talks about what business leaders say. 89% want limits, 85% say that the finance system is in bad shape or broken, needs an overhaul, and 75% say the campaign system is corrupt. Go ahead, if you would, I'm going to wrap up here. And why a constitutional amendment? A little bit of information cut off, let me explain here. It's permanent. If we pass a bill like the McCain Fine Bill, a key Feingold bill, it can get overridden by the next Congress, all right? So it, it's not permanent. An amendment, on the other hand, would be. How do you pass it? It takes a two thirds vote of both chambers, the House and the Senate, and then after that, three fourths of the states have to ratify it. So it's a big challenge, but it's happened, I think, eight of the 27 times, he says here, have overturned previous Supreme Court rulings, which were found to be either out of date or just dead wrong. Women's rights to vote. Uh, 18 year olds can vote, um, the slave uh, changes, slave laws, uh, things that were drastically uh, wrong that were changed by amendments. Okay, go ahead if you would. And basically, as you've been hearing, our, for a freedom amendment would restore the rights of Americans to regular election. Again, it would allow states, which is a state's rights issue, which in spite of Mitch McConnell's objection, it is something the Republican Party really is strong on. The states have their rights. That's the way our government should react. So that's why it needs to happen. A question comes up quite often, what is the bill that's being introduced? Well, there are a couple of them that have been. American Promise is steadfast in the idea it has to be a bipartisan bill. Uh, right now, a lot of Democrats have signed on, in fact, the vast majority have signed on at the national level. But we're taking the position that that's not going to work. It's got to be bipartisan or it's not going to work well. So that's where we are. Uh, 22 states have said we're ready to ratify. Toward that 38, Ohio is not one of them, obviously. Uh, but uh, Virginia and Maryland just became the 22nd. And there are a number of others that have said they're close. So we need 16 more. Uh, and hopefully in the next couple of years, we can get there. That's why it's a grassroots approach. That's why I feel speaking to Rotaries, which are influential people, they're business people, they're other civic leaders that do have some clout. Uh, I, as an individual going in, I found out representative householders uh, ain't how much influence I had. It took me about 10 seconds to say, no, this will never happen. Well, they do listen to business people and other leaders, church leaders, I would hope. So the good news is Americans are united. Uh, high percentage of business people and this is something American Promise feels. This is a in this tumultuous, uh, bipartisan, not bipartisan, it's polarized time. This is something that 87 percent of people agree on. It's something we ought to be able to get action on. I would uh, would also tie it to, um, as I said, I, the main reason I've gotten involved and stayed involved, even as an elder, is the mission of the church. It's more about that than it is the Bible and things like that. Quite frankly. I was raised Catholic, and uh, I didn't do much Bible work. But, uh, but you know, again, seriously, the, the, to me, the biggest value of the church is the mission work we do, the outreach to help the people who are not, who get the short end of the stick in our economic system. Uh, and I think this is something that should appeal to uh, Presbyterians, to other churches and other denominations. Um, 
So I'll leave it at that. See if what other comments or questions you might have. We're at about 9.42. Other thoughts, questions, disagreements? What else would you? So my first question is what can you know we do to help out? Glad you asked. Okay, that was nice. I already signed that. Well, I, skipped so. up. All right. <laughs> uh, I would say contact candidates. I don't know which district you're in, uh, but if your uh, Stephanie Kunze is not running, she was uh, term limited, uh, you might contact those, or even more importantly, maybe contact uh, our Senate uh, candidates in place of Rob Portman. What's their position? All right. Uh, I haven't heard what one of them. I know what one of them is. Uh, I think uh, Democratic candidate has signed on. He is very much in favor of this. I'm not sure about it. His opponent. Uh, so I, that would be one way. Contact his office, see if you can get an answer. Letters to the editor are very effective. I was able a couple of years ago to get an op ed in, and I got a lot of response to that people do read. Unfortunately, I don't think there's a high percentage of people subscribing to the dispatch anymore. Uh, most of them are online, which is fine. But uh, to your question, uh, contacting candidates, uh, getting their position. And then following up, say, I got this response from this candidate, his or her opponent won't give me an answer or is not in favor. And let people know this is an important issue and this is how people running um, are positioning themselves. Uh, get on the uh, AmericanPromise.net uh, website. There's a wealth of information there. Uh, there's a place uh, that you can sign online and then you get information from American Promise. Uh, you, know, you can get yourself back off of it if you decide it's too much. Uh, it's not a lifelong commitment. Uh, but there is a tremendous amount of information out there. I mean, it's been a learning curve for me in the last five years. Uh, and it's kind of overwhelming uh, how much information is there. Again, I would really recommend if you have an app called Libby, it's a library app. I didn't know about it until I found this book at the public library down the street. Uh, <clears throat> and you can read the book, which is 15 hours long. You can even speed it up to 1.25 and still follow it when you're walking, whatever, or whatever you're doing. It's a fascinating book. It really reveals a lot about how we've got to the point where we are in this country, the polarization and the system that we have, which is a marvelous system, I'm not criticizing the economic system we have. It's just that it's been taken over, experts would say, by big money. Big, big, big book. Yes, sir. It would, it would seem as though big money has found a hole here in terms of the structure that they've taken advantage of. If, if we put limits on uh, their contributions, does that hole then open up for somebody else that maybe has objectives that, objectives that we are sympathetic with to step into and is there, is there something yeah. that can be done to, to plug that hole? That's a good point. But if, if the legislation is successful, and again, it could be state by state, it could be national eventually, um, if you limit the, the amount of contributions and have a way of really policing it, so you get rid of the dark money uh, and the, the shell games, um, then I would think whoever's going to try to fill that hole is still going to be held to those criteria. That, uh, I can't donate huge amounts of money. I still might have some influence because I said earlier, lobbying is not a sin. You know, we those legislators need information from companies and individuals, organizations, churches, whatever. But lobbying with a bag of money is a whole other story. If we can eliminate that, I think we'll make a major step toward cleaning up the system. So this, this same money could flow to people that agree to be a lobbyist, then spend their time in the halls getting to the politicians well, and leaning on them. You're right. The, 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 the evil geniuses <laughs> use that title, find a way around the system. So the system has to be uh, has to be pretty thoroughly developed and then monitored and probably redeveloped and uh, tweaked as time goes on. Uh, it's an excellent question, but right now we know the system we have has been corrupted somewhat. You know, not because we have a bad economic system, free enterprise system is the best in the world, but, but it's not operating in a way that benefits the average citizen or even small and mid sized businesses. We're probably about out of time. I want to hold yeah. you up.
Yes. What, what's the book that you were suggesting? Evil Geniuses, Kurt okay. Anderson, K-U-R-T Anderson. And it's available at the library on that Libby app. You probably can get it in hard copy. It was just my introduction to Libby, which was really kind of fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, you can be driving, listen to it on your radio probably. But, uh, it's a fantastic book, it really, especially for somebody like me who's not a historian by any stretch. Um, just revealing what, what has happened over the years, <clears throat> what happened in the 90s, how we got in this polar situation. The other thing you remind me of, Bill, is the uh, gerrymandering contributes to this problem tremendously. We get politicians in the primaries and have to run in the extreme. I was a huge <laughs> fan of uh, John McCain, for example, and I watched his last campaign. He's campaigning way to the right. I think, what, what happened? Well, it was the primary. He had to realize who his voters were. He moved way to the right, won the primary, came back to the middle. And that's what both parties have to do. So polarization through uh, the primaries and the, the uh, uh, gerrymandering is really part of the problem. And we're not getting rid of that. No, I, our legislators are pretty much thumb the nose. They, the Supreme Court said, no, nah, we're not going to do it. So. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Let's close in prayer. Let's pray. Oh God, thank you for this time. And we pray that you would bless us, give your people courage and creativity and wisdom. And please, oh God, bless our government, bless our community and our nation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, the answer to your question would be, let other people know that what we're talking about.